Hello everyone, and thank you for joining today's discussion on atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, or AHUS. As a reminder, today's events will also be streaming on Facebook Live. My name is Ryan Woolley, and I am Director of Public Education at the American Kidney Fund. And today, February 28, 2022, is Rare Disease Day. Rare Disease Day is held each year on the last day of February to raise awareness for rare diseases and improve access to treatment and medical representation for individuals with rare diseases and their families. In today's webinar, AKF is spotlighting the rare disease of atypical hemolytic ure uremic syndrome. We would like to thank Alexion for their support for this educational program. And before I introduce you to our guest for today, I wanna to go over a few housekeeping items. This event is being live streamed on Zoom and Facebook. If you're watching live, we encourage you to join the conversation. Let us know you're here in the comments section and type any questions you have using the Q&A feature on Zoom or the comments section of Facebook. And we'll try to get as many questions as we can during the Q&A. At the end of this webinar, we will include a link to a brief satisfaction survey in the chat if you're on Zoom, you can also click continue after the survey ends to get to the, the survey. And we kindly ask that you take a few minutes to complete it. Your honest feedback will help us continue to make our programs the best they can be. And finally, if you're a health professional and believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. While this webinar is not accredited, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Also, please note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available for you to view afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Bradley Dixon. Dr. Dixon is currently an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and Children's Hospital Colorado. Dr. Dixon's clinical interests focus on complement-mediated renal diseases, such as atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome and C3 polymerulopathy. Dr. Dixon is also an investigator in several clinical trials of complement-targeted therapies in these diseases. Dr. Dixon, please go ahead and say hello to our listeners. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you. And we also have Jeff Schmidt, a member of the AHUS Alliance and father to a daughter whose AHUS triggered in 2011. Jeff, we're so happy to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about your family's personal journey with AHUS? Sure, Ryan. Um, hey, everybody, and Dr. Dixon, glad to see you again. Um, we live in uh, outside of Philadelphia and uh, Pennsylvania in the US. Um, and like you said, back in 20, 11, my daughter Erica got sick. She was 22 at the time. It was one month before eclizumab was approved by the FDA. Um, her HOS was triggered by a virus, but she was misdiagnosed with TTP for the first six months. Um, so she was on plasmapheresis and dialysis. Um, but after two months, she got better. Um, so they stopped the treatment, but 10 days later, she relapsed back on plasmapheresis and dialysis, and our kidneys really, you know, she, it took another huge hit. This was devastating to us um, uh, as, uh, you know, it had a huge impact on her mental health and our whole family's mental health. Um, my wife, Denise, early on quit her job. Um, I went to work, I went to the hospital, I loved my daughter, but I felt crippled. I, I, I couldn't, you know, I, I didn't, do any research or anything because I was afraid to get bad news. But my wife Denise was strong um, and she researched um, and she found some information about AHOS online, even though there wasn't much at the time. Um, and so she talked to the doctors about that, um, but they weren't willing to diagnose AHOS at that point. But six, six months after getting sick, um, they sent, sent us to a, a specialist who eventually diagnosis with AHUS. Um, and so she started um, 
occlusum of at that time, occlusum ab at that time, um, which the blood work, HOS blood work looked great at that point, but the kidneys still looked horrible. I mean, she was a complete kidney failure. So the nephrologist told us we needed to get a kidney transplant. And so we went through the grueling process of getting approved. Um, and while we were waiting, um, Erica and Denise went to a conference on rare, di rare diseases. And I believe it was, a, it was all Alexion doctors, but I'm not positive because I wasn't there. But um, they, they were talking to with this one, one doctor who said, hey, hang on, wait on getting a kidney transplant because eculizumab um, has been proven to, you know, to sometimes bring back some or, or all kidney function. So that was great because we don't, we don't want to go through the you know, transplant process. Um, so we waited. And then on November 8th, 2012, one of the best days of my life, I got this incredible text from my daughter, Erica, saying her lab work was so good that she didn't have to do dialysis anymore. Um, I remember that day forever. Um, and since then, she's been on eclizumab every two weeks. Um, we get home infusion. Uh, her nurses test, test more. She's the greatest ever. She's like family. I mean, I could, I could spend the whole hour talking about her, but anyway. Um, uh, but we've decided that um, Erica's, or we feel Erica's not a good ca candidate for stopping treatment. I mean, it's been 10 years or 10 and a half years, um, but she's not a good candidate for stopping treatment because she has the factor H mutation Plus she has the significant kidney damage. So we, we really, she can't afford another hit. But hopefully, you know, my story will give people, other people with the HUS, especially the new ones, hope that, you know, you can live a good life. I mean, my daughter, you know, lives a, a, a normal life other than, you know, getting treatment every two weeks. And uh, yeah, anyway, that's it for, for now. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and for, for joining us today for this um, Q&A that will have um, you know, a chance for people to ask you more questions too after um, a little bit later today. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. So I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot one thing I wanted to mention. This is the hopeful sure. part. Um, she's able to work a full-time job. She had been um, teaching 12 to 18 month old children. Uh, up until recently, she became a full-time nanny. And she and her husband are fostering two amazing little girls in the hopes of adopting them. So that is the part that says she's living a good life. I, I missed that part and I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's uh, it's important. I'm glad you, you shared that too. That's um, it's incredible. All right, so before we get to the questions that everyone um, is submitting to us, we're gonna learn a little bit more about HUS. So Rare Disease Day brings awareness to over 7,000 rare diseases that affect 300 million people around the world. And AHUS is just one of those many rare diseases that affect the kidneys. So we'd like to get started today with a presentation from Dr. Dixon about AHUS, how it's diagnosed and what the treatment options are. You're on mute, mute, Dr. Dixon. Thank you. I couldn't you find the unmute button. Can you all hear me now? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, again, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you all today. And I'm just going to um, spend the next 30 minutes or so um, going over the, um, the cause, the diagnosis, the treatment, and management of AHUS. So um, first we'll talk about what AHUS is and what causes it, and then talk about how it's diagnosed. Uh, we'll talk about how it's treated, and then finally how it's managed. Okay, so AHUS or atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome is a genetic disease of uh, abnormal regulation, defective regulation of the complement system. And the complement system is part of our immune system, and it can be activated by a wide variety of clinical conditions, including uh, many different infections, certain medications, pregnancy, 
surgery, and a host of others. And in patients with AHUS, once complement is activated by one of these conditions, it cannot be re-regulated. And this uncontrolled activation of the complement system causes damage to cells lining blood vessels called endothelial cells. And that ultimately leads to injury to many different organs in the body. So to talk a little bit more about complement, the complement system is part of our innate immune system. And what that means is that it's able to protect us against infection from birth onward. And it does not need to be previously exposed to an infectious threat in order to be active against it. And the complement system is active against a wide variety of potential infectious threats, including the cell walls of bacteria and funguses, as well as antibodies that may stick to harmful proteins. And so we like to call this the uh, Swiss army knife, if you will, of the immune system. The, uh, another aspect of complement in, is that it can be rapidly amplified in just a few minutes, and that gives it its uh, protective power. And this is because there's a small amount of complement activation happening in our blood at all times. And so we like to think of this as the shock troops of the immune system, like these Navy, Se Navy SEALs here. So as I mentioned, AHUS is a genetic disease of defective regulation of the complement system. And this can happen in a couple different ways. There can be loss of function mutations in some of the proteins that help regulate or slow down the complement system. And these include genes like uh, factor H, factor I, membrane cofactor protein, thrombomodulin, or um, antibodies that inactivate factor H. And in this case, this is like um, the inability to diffuse a uh, complement once it's activated. This can also happen with gain of function mutations in some of the activating parts of complement, like factor B and C3. And in this situation, it's as the complement can't be diffused even if we have normal regulatory proteins in place. We tend to think of AHUS as an autosomal dominant condition. And what that means is that we only need to inherit one of two copies of a, a gene with a mutation to have the disease. The mutation can be inherited from um, either mom or dad. And um, generally 50% of children of an affected person will themselves be affected. And what that means is in an autosomal dominant condition like AHUS, there's a 50% chance or a one in two chance that your child will receive the mutation um, potentially causing disease. However, we know that AHUS is characterized by something called incomplete penetrance. And what that means is not everyone who inherits a mutation from their parent um, will have uh, clinically evident disease. And that means that there are other factors, uh, perhaps other genes or other specific exposures that will determine who has uh, symptoms of AHUS and who does not. So AHUS is a form of thrombotic microangiopathy or TMA. And thrombotic microangiopathy is really a description of a category of diseases rather than a single disease itself. Um, and this category uh, shares, uh, the, the members of this category share clinical features and appearance under the microscope. The common link between all of the different uh, members of this category is injury to cells that line blood vessels called endothelial cells. And once endothelial cells are injured, like in this picture down here in the bottom, platelets are able to stick to that uh, injured endothelium. And that um, ultimately begins to form clots. And as platelets stick to the injured endothelial cell and clots form, more platelets are consumed. And this leads to a low level of platelets in the blood or thrombocytopenia. Red blood cells as they're floating past these tiny clots can be broken apart by the rough surface of the clots. And this leads to a breakdown of red blood cells called hemolysis. And ultimately these tiny clots can restrict blood flow to different organs in the body that can lead to organ dysfunction. AHUS is one of several forms of TMA. 
Um, another form of uh, TMA is the more common form of HUS, and that is the shigatoxin uh, producing E. coli associated form of HUS. And that represents about 90% of HUS. Another form of TMA that's uh, commonly identified in adults um, is called thrombocytopenic, uh, sorry, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TTP. And it can look very similar to AHUS and can sometimes uh, lead to misdiagnosis, as Jeff uh, mentioned earlier. Beyond these forms of TMA, there are many other forms of TMA, all of which can look very similar clinically. There can be overlapping uh, of triggering events between the different forms of TMA, and this can lead to diagnostic confusion. Occasionally, a diarrheal illness, a gastrointestinal illness, can uh, trigger AHUS, but that can um, confuse healthcare providers in thinking that it may be the E. coli form of HUS. Similarly, a viral illness um, with associated fever may serve as a trigger for AHUS, but as fever is a prominent feature of TTP, it may lead to a misdiagnosis with TTP. There can also be some overlap of clinical features that leads to diagnostic confusion. The kidney dysfunction in AHUS is often quite severe, but on occasion, depending on the mutation involved, it can be more mild. And mild kidney dysfunction is a feature of TTP, and so that may lead to misdiagnosis with TTP. Similarly, neurological problems can indeed be a feature of atypical HUS, but it can also be a feature of shigatoxin-associated HUS or TTP. And so the presence of neurological symptoms may also lead to diagnostic confusion. In terms of the clinical features of AHUS, most commonly it is a um, abrupt onset with rapid progression in about 80% of patients who present with symptoms of being pale, weak, with nausea and vomiting, and ultimately that may indicate uh, multi-organ dysfunction or failure. But in a minority of patients, it may be more slowly progressive with symptoms, um, with, without symptoms, but with uh, laboratory abnormalities, including anemia and low platelet counts for some time before it come, becomes uh, clinically evident. Unfortunately, one of the aspects of AHUS that's especially problematic for me as a nephrologist is that it has a very high recurrence rate after kidney transplantation. And that means if you're a patient with AHUS and you receive a kidney transplant, um, it is uh, very likely that AHUS may affect the new kidney. To talk a little bit more about the clinical features, a large study was published several years ago um, looking at over 800 patients with AHUS. And in these patients, uh, whereas previously we used to think of AHUS as largely a disease of childhood, but in this very large study of over 800 patients, only 45% of patients presented for the first time in childhood. Of those patients who presented in childhood, roughly ha uh, half were female and half were male with perhaps a slight male predominance of those patients presenting in childhood. However, in adulthood, which made up 55% of the uh, patients in this study, 65% of patients were female when they presented in adulthood. So a two to one ratio of females to males. And this has uh, been hypothesized to be, or thought to be due to the influence of pregnancy as a trigger. A family history could be identified in a minority of patients, about 16% of patients, or 20% of patients who presented in childhood. Another uh, aspect that came from this large study is the recognition that AHUS is a multi-system disease. We certainly know that kidneys are prominently affected in AHUS, but because complement proteins circulate in our blood and protect us from infections throughout our body, AHUS can affect other organs as well. And in the global AHUS registry, that was uh, this a study that I've mentioned, a third of patients had uh, clinical involvement of their heart and blood vessels, like with a heart attack, fluid around their heart, or poor blood flow to their extremities. About a fourth of patients 
had neurological problems as part of their initial uh, presentation with seizures, stroke, confusion, or coma as part of their initial presentation. Over a third of patients had uh, gastrointestinal involvement of their disease, and this included um, uh, diarrhea or bloody diarrhea, but also involved uh, liver injury or pancreas injury. And then about 20% of patients in this large registry had lung involvement with um, bleeding in the lungs as the most common uh, feature. How is AHUS diagnosed? Well, as I mentioned, AHUS is a uh, one form of TMA. And so TMA is diagnosed um, when, uh, when certain laboratory evidence points to it. And one standard laboratory test that can indicate TMA is a complete blood count or CBC with uh, examination of the blood under the microscope or a review of the blood smear. And a CBC may indicate anemia, which is low hemoglobin and low hematocrit due to hemolysis or breakdown of red blood cells. It may indicate a low platelet count, which is thrombocytopenia. And examination of the blood under, under the microscope may identify red blood cell fragments or broken pieces of red blood cells called schistocytes. Other tests that can point to TMA and AHUS as a form of TMA include a blood test called lactate dehydrogenase or LDH. And that uh, is an enzyme that's inside cells. And when cells break apart, that enzyme is released uh, and levels increase in the blood. Kidney function tests are also often abnormal in the setting of TMA with blood urea nitrogen or BUN and creatinine being elevated when the kidneys are not working properly. When a urinalysis is performed, it may indicate blood in the urine and, pro, uh, and protein in the urine. And blood in the urine may happen due to the kidney injury that's part of AHUS and TMA. And it may also be, oops, it may also be due to um, hemoglobin released from uh, red blood cells as they break down and are filtered into the urine by the kidneys. Protein in the urine is also caused by kidney injury and blood and protein in the urine may be present um, when there is active disease, but it may also be present if there's been sufficient uh, kidney damage that's irreversible and chronic, chronically present. In terms of an investigation of the complement system, um, often a number of uh, blood tests are done to look at complement, and this include measuring complement proteins like C3 and C4 in the blood, measuring levels of complement regulatory proteins like factor H, um, examination for factor H autoantibody in the blood. And then finally, measuring um, levels of complement protein fragments that are produced when complement is activated. And the most commonly tested one of these is called SC5B9, which sounds like a droid from Star Wars, but it's a collection of complement proteins uh, that are formed when complement is activated. Genetic testing uh, provides us perhaps the most complete way to look at complement uh, in investigation of a patient with AHUS or TMA. And there are clear implications for prognosis uh, from the results of genetic testing in that patients with uh, mutations like factor H may have the most um, uh, aggressive uh, uh, progression to uh, requiring dialysis, uh, whereas patients with um, mutations in membrane cofactor protein, or MCP, uh, may have um, a more favorable, uh, slower progression or no progression. Similarly, transplant recurrence is also informed by uh, genetic testing results in that patients with factor, uh, mutations in factor H or factor I, uh, factor B or C3 may be more likely to have recurrence after kidney transplant than a patient with a mutation in membrane cofactor protein, or MCP, or diacylglycerol kinase epsilon, which is called DGKE. Some of the downsides to genetic testing is that it's quite expensive, um, often costing thousands of dollars, and insurance may not be uh, able to pay for that testing. It also takes weeks to months, typically, to get results, and so it may not tell us very much in the acute setting when someone first presents with AHUS. 
Another difficulty with genetic testing is that the results are not always clear cut. Sometimes if a mutation is detected, we're not sure if it has a functional change in the protein and thus not sure if it actually causes disease. And this is called a variant of undetermined clinical significance or VUS. Conversely, sometimes no mutation is detected despite um, everything we can do to uh, examine the, the genetics. And this lack of an identified mutation happens in 30 to 40% of patients with AHUS. And just because a mutation is not identified does not rule out or exclude AHUS as a diagnosis, nor does it indicate that complement targeted uh, therapy is ineffective. I get asked questions often about whether family members should be tested um, if, a, if a mutation is identified in a patient. And there's a lot of debate on this issue. Not everyone with the mutation, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, is symptomatic. And so should we treat someone who doesn't have any evidence of disease activity or symptoms with medication? Most people would say no. Therefore, uh, why would we determine who may be at risk? Although the converse to this is um, knowing who may ultimately be at risk for developing disease may help us recognize it early if they present with uh, symptoms that suggest their disease is active. The Genetic in Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, was legislation passed over 10 years ago that prohibits employers and health insurance companies from discriminating against a person with a known uh, genetic disease with a positive genetic result. However, this legislation does not extend to life insurance or disability insurance, so there may be um, additional challenges uh, in testing asymptomatic family members. At the end of the day, AHUS is what we call a clinical diagnosis. And that means that right now there's no laboratory test that can 100% uh, determine beyond any doubt that a person either does or does not have AHUS. And a healthcare provider can only make a diagnosis of AHUS by putting together the puzzle pieces of a person's symptoms, their past history or family history, and results of blood tests and laboratory tests to make that diagnosis. How is AHUS treated? Um, the earliest form of treatment of AHUS, and one that is still in use today in many parts of the world, is plasma therapy, either plasmapheresis or plasma infusion. In the first uses of plasma therapy to treat AHUS were reported over 30 years ago. And the mechanism of action of plasma infusion is by providing the normal regulatory proteins that are in plasma to, uh, to re-regulate the complement system. And in the case of plasmapheresis, uh, to remove abnormal complement proteins or autoantibodies. Although there are many uh, reports of the effectiveness of plasma infusion, there have been no clinical trials that have definitively um, shown effectiveness comparing plasma therapy with supportive care alone in the treatment of AHUS. Some of the pros of treating with plasma uh, include the fact that this is uh, plasma therapy is the first line treatment for TTP. And so if there's diagnostic confusion between AHUS and TTP, a healthcare provider may choose to use plasma to treat both diseases. Plasma is also available at most pediatric and adult centers around the world. And so this may be what is used to treat patients where uh, uh, in parts of the world where complement targeted therapy or other therapies may not be available due to cost or approval status in that part of the world. Some of the downsides to plasma include allergic reactions to plasma, um, and that plasmapheresis as a procedure is technically very difficult in small children. Additionally, some patients may continue to have disease activity despite plasma treatment, or if their disease goes into remission with plasma, it may relapse after stopping. And um, plasma therapy is really all we had uh, to treat patients with AHUS until the advent of eculizumab and ravulizumab, which are antibodies that bind to the complement protein C5 and help shut down the complement system at the level of C5 
by preventing the formation of this complex C5B9, which is known as the membrane attack complex, which provides the destructive power of complement. And eculizumab was approved by the FDA to treat AHUS in 2011. And ravulizumab, which is a long-acting derivative of eculizumab, was approved by the FDA to treat AHUS uh, very recently in 2019. Some of the uh, upsides to using eculizumab and ravulizumab is that it's a very well-tolerated infusion, typically. It uh, generally only requires a peripheral IV. It has a fairly short infusion length with uh, typically no premedication necessary. And it's been shown to be highly effective in uh, treating patients with AHUS, either with or without a known complement mutation. Some of the downsides, of course, is that it's, uh, they're quite expensive medications. And there is ongoing debate as to the optimal duration of treatment with these medicines. And just like plasma therapy, stopping the medication may uh, lead to relapse of AHUS in some patients. Some patients with AHUS may need to be treated with non-standard dosing. And uh, some patients may actually need to be treated more frequently with dosing than the, uh, than the standard dosing regimen of every two weeks in an adult. And this may be due to breakthrough uh, complement activation or breakthrough disease activity um, uh, in between doses. And this may be particularly true for pediatric patients who are susceptible to breakthrough um, during their um, initial uh, treatment with the, tr uh, with the medication. On the other hand, some patients may be able to extend their dosing interval beyond every two weeks. And this may be done um, between the patient and their healthcare provider due to side effects of their medication on a standard dosing interval, or just because of the burden of infusion frequency. However, um, extending beyond the standard dosing interval is typically done with very careful monitoring of disease activity, as well as monitoring of uh, the uh, degree of complement blockade. What are the risks of eculizumab and ravulizumab? The primary risk, because complement protects us against infection, is infection, specifically a bacteria that can cause um, meningitis and bloodstream infections called Neisseria meningitidis or meningococcus. And because of this risk, patients started on these medications should be vaccinated against meningococcus at least two weeks before starting the medication. However, patients are often too sick to wait after their meningococcal vaccination to start eculizumab or ravulizumab. And so for that reason, preventative antibiotics are often given for two weeks until the vaccines have uh, taken effect. My personal practice, however, is to give preventative antibiotics as a second form of protection, as long as a patient is on eculizumab or ravulizumab, and generally up to 12 weeks after the medication is stopped. Even if a patient is fully vaccinated against meningococcus and is on preventative antibiotics, they are still at risk for life-threatening infections from meningococcus. And so um, I always counsel my patients uh, to seek medical attention right away if they exhibit signs of fever or other concerning symptoms for meningococcal infection. And patients are always instructed to carry a patient safety information card such as this one uh, to show to their medical provider when they go to the hospital. How long should we treat patients with eculizumab and ravulizumab? This is really the million dollar question, uh, pun intended. Um, and the truth is no one knows for sure. Some patients may indeed be able to discontinue therapy safely. And that is um, a patient, for example, with a known uh, MCP mutation without other uh, mutations that have a more favorable long-term outcome. In, in contrast, there are patients that may need to remain on therapy uh, uh, with eculizumab or ravulizumab indefinitely, such as someone who has lost a previous kidney transplant to recurrent AHUS, or patients with mutations in diseases uh, in genes with the worst outcome like factor H. There is some published experience on the discontinuation of eculizumab or ravulizumab, and some of this earliest uh, published information comes from Italy, where 16 patients with AHUS were discontinued on uh, from their eculizumab, five of whom, or about a third, experienced relapse. And this is primarily patients with uh, factor H mutations or uh, factor H autoantibody. 
And in these patients, restarting eculizumab led to rapid improvement in their kidney function. A more recent study from France uh, uh, described 38 patients who discontinued eculizumab, 12 of whom, or about a third, also experienced relapse. And this was predominantly patients with factor H mutations where eight of the 11 um, experienced relapse, about half of patients with MCP mutations, and no patients without an identified um, uh, complement mutation had relapse after discontinuation. Early introduction of eculizumab for those patients who did relapse, again, led to rapid improvement in their platelet count and return of kidney function back to its baseline. Just a, a brief word about liver transplantation in AHOS. Um, the, the theory behind liver transplantation is that it may restore the production of healthy protein uh, produced by the liver that regulates complement. And these proteins include factor H, factor I, factor B, and C3. Liver transplantation is likely ineffective in patients with MCP or thrombomodulin or DGKE mutations because these proteins aren't made by the liver. The earliest uh, experience with liver transplantation uh, had very poor outcomes, but later experience uh, by, for example, Jeff Salland at Columbia University um, have had much better outcomes. And at present, this uh, represents the best chance at a cure for AHUS. What's on the horizon for treatment of AHUS? This includes uh, medications in development that also target C5 like crovalimab, semdisiran, and xylucoplan, um, as well as medications that target other proteins in the complement system, such as the lectin pathway, factor D, factor B, and C3. And whereas eculizumab and ravulizumab target here in the terminal pathway, we know that AHUS is largely a disease of alternative pathway regulation in this shaded area. And so these medications that I've listed um, have promise to treat uh, AHUS in different ways. And finally, how is AHUS managed? Um, it's largely managed by regular laboratory monitoring either on or off therapy. And this includes some of the same lab tests I've already shared with you, like LDH and CBC, watching for hemolysis or falling platelet counts, B1 and creatinine to monitor for worsening of kidney function, urinalysis to look for blood and protein in the urine. And I wanted to make a special point about this, that if um, on treatment, blood and protein resolve from the urine, um, checking a urinalysis at home with sticks that you can buy uh, in the pharmacy or even over the internet may serve as an early warning system if blood and protein reappear, um, particularly if someone has discontinued therapy. Blood pressure may also be a silent indicator of disease activity. And so measuring blood pressure at home may also be helpful. And if blood pressure begins to rise for no apparent reason, this may also serve as a warning sign for um, relapse or increased disease activity. Additionally, um, AHUS um, is managed by connection to the AHUS community and the rare disease community. And this includes uh, patient community groups like AHUS um, Alliance Action, the Atypical HUS Foundation, um, the AHUS Action Network, uh, the, uh, as well as rare disease networks like the National Organization of Rare Diseases, or NORD, and Global Genes. In addition, connect, connection to other sources of support is important, and this includes uh, family members and loved ones, uh, connection to the healthcare provider, and connection to resources with um, uh, Alexion or other pharmaceutical uh, industry members. And finally, I wanted to mention that mental well being is an important aspect of managing any chronic disease, including AHUS. And so it's important to be able to recognize signs and symptoms within yourself or within a loved one with, uh, uh, of depression and anxiety. So thank you for your attention, and um, I'll turn it back over to Ryan. All right, thank you so much for talking, um, taking us through all this great information, Dr. Dixon. Um, and now we'll open it up to um, some questions. Um, so please, um, if you haven't already, send in your questions via Zoom or Facebook, and we'll try to answer as many as possible the rest of the hour we have. 
Um, so before I get to your live questions, um, Jeff, Jeff has collected some questions from the AHUS community leading up to today. So Jeff, can you talk more about your, um, the video project that you have been working on with the AHUS Alliance? You're, you're on mute, sorry, Jeff. You don't want to hear me anyway. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So this uh, for the last two months, I've been collect. I, you know, the HOS Alliance uh, gave our uh, community a chance to ask a question about HOS that they wanted answered. Um, I received questions from 67 families from 21 countries, and um, so they sent in their their photo, uh, name, where they're from, and their question. And I created a slide for each one and then made a slideshow video out of it that was posted this morning on our, uh, on YouTube actually. Um, uh, and a number, of these, a number of these questions have been answered by Dr. Dixon already in his awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Um, and uh, others, you know, will, will probably be answered, or you're gonna ask some of those questions that have been, you know, that I, that, you know, that are from this video. Um, but we will, um, you know, the, we'll, the HOS Alliance is going to create a, a series of articles um, addressing all the questions, um, you know, trying to answer what we can on our own and, you know, getting expert help on some of the others. But, you know, so stay tuned uh, for those um, questions or those answers. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great video. And, um... My team will be sharing it in the chat so that you can um, access it after this session and, and see all the questions that were submitted. And, and so it's my personal touch with the pictures um, as well. And so we've incorporated some questions here and then we've also got some, um, a bunch that have been asked live. And so um, a lot of questions have been around the genetic component of HUS um, and like, so a question that we've been getting is, are there are tests that um, people should take or they should be having their children take to see if they're at higher risk. I think I'll take that question perhaps. Um, so um, probably the best, uh, the best advice in terms of uh, children of someone who's been diagnosed with AHOS or a patient with AHOS um, would be to, to um, be aware of symptoms, even nonspecific symptoms that can sometimes indicate AHOS is active and to seek medical attention, um, even for simple lab tests like the LDH and CBC. Um, if we know someone is at risk for developing the condition and is exhibiting those symptoms. Um, Beyond that, um, there, isn't, um, there isn't a good way to, to determine who ultimately will or will not develop uh, AHOS in the future um, because we know that um, even um, uh, patients who share the same mutation uh, or individuals who share the same mutation, some may uh, develop disease and some may not. And that's back to that incomplete penetrance uh, concept. And um, just with one of the questions touching on that that was in the Q&A, um, we think that uh, the penetrance of AHOS is about 50%, um, roughly. That's as best as we know from um, a few small studies that show that um, there's uh, a roughly 50% chance if you have the mutation of developing the condition. So again, not everyone who has the mutation um, has a mutation will develop disease, but it's around 50%. It. Thank you. And um, kind of along those lines, there's a few questions from people too that, um, you know, if a, a woman is trying to bear children and, and get pregnant, is there um, a test to take to like while, while they're pregnant or any kind of recommendations around pregnancy? And this is, I guess, maybe to, to answer the question, if this is um, a person who knows that they already have AHOS or a patient with AHOS, a woman who's um, um, getting ready to start a family like that, um, I would definitely share that 
uh, information with their um, with their uh, uh, obstetrical uh, healthcare provider, in that um, sometimes it takes that uh, that healthcare provider um, some additional awareness and additional research to know that pregnancy can indeed serve as a trigger for AHUS, even if they're not familiar with the condition itself. Um, and hopefully that would lead the healthcare provider to be more closely monitoring someone, particularly in the late stages of pregnancy, um, usually the third uh, trimester um, or the immediate postpartum period right after delivery is when AHUS uh, tends to manifest in, in, uh, in pregnant women. So um, other than careful monitoring by the uh, obstetrical healthcare provider who is made aware of, of that condition, um, um, that would be important. If it were perhaps a child of uh, uh, a, a female child of someone, a patient with AHUS, um, uh, I think it would be appropriate to share that risk, um, uh, especially if uh, that individual also has the mutation with the healthcare provider, even if they have not themselves exhibited symptoms or signs of the disease being active, but just for the healthcare provider, the obstetrical healthcare provider to be aware of that risk to, uh, to monitor closely. Got it, got it, thanks for sharing. Um, I, I could add a little, little to that. Um, there, I know of a, a number of uh, you know, uh, women who've had with HUS who've had successful pregnancies um, on treatment. Um, you know, there's, we have this uh, Facebook group that, you know, that, and there's a lot of people always discussing that. And so it is, it is something that, you know, and it, you know, apparently the eclizumab or ravalizumab does not affect the baby. Um, Dr. Dixon, maybe you can mention or talk about that, but, um, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of, lot of successes with that. So I hope that gives hope to, to our family, HOS family. Maybe if I can tack on a little bit to that question, uh, Jeff, or that, that, um, that part. Um, initially when HOS, oh, sorry, when um, eculizumab was first approved by the FDA, there was um, some uncertainty about uh, its safety uh, because it's an antibody and antibodies can cross the placenta um, but what we know um, from a lot of experience or some experience with patients with PNH and now patients with AHUS, so conditions treated by eculizumab, that um, we, uh, there's, there's um, no evidence that eculizumab is harmful to a developing fetus um, and uh, may actually, uh, to your point, Jeff, protect, um, protect mom from developing um, uh, uh, disease activity during pregnancy. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, um, like I'm, I'm a patient advocate on the uh, the AHUS registry along with Marguerite Eigenbaum from Canada, and uh, the registry recently post uh, posted a uh, a manuscript on on the successes of pregnancy. Um, so that's something that um, if anybody. Anybody you know in our age age community wants to reach out to me to to get that like it's in PDF form. Um, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, maybe you guys can give my email address in the chat. If somebody you know, wants to um, reach out to me, I, you know, and they're interested in, in seeing that study. Um, I will send that to them. Sure, that'd be great. Um, and you, you mentioned um, the AHUS community and the the alliance and curious if you could talk more about that because there's so much information um, to know about this disease and um, you know I'm just wondering how you found the alliance and um, you know what is it that you do with the alliance okay well let me let me do this let me read uh, our mission statement because I can't say it as well as it's written um, the AHUS alliance through the collaboration of its affiliates will promote global awareness of AHUS will work with international AHUS researchers and by supporting newly emerging national AHUS patient groups will bring relief and support to those affected by AHUS to save and improve the quality of more lives. And one of my main roles is involves supporting newly emerging national AHUS patient groups. 
Uh, we have this initiative called Rest of the World, or ROW, where I reach out to, um, to those affected by AHUS in countries that don't have an official AHUS association or support group. And I help them connect with, with others in their country by creating private Facebook groups and public pages uh, for their country. Um, I've created over the, over the last several years, 19 of these groups. They're all small, you know, they might have a couple people um, up to maybe 10, but most of them are really small, but it's a great way for them to connect to each other. Um, and as they become more engaged, you know, they can get more involved with the AHUS Alliance and then hopefully one day become an official association. That's great. Thanks um, for the information. And also people on my team have shared in the chat um, the, the links to the AHUS Alliance. So if anyone is interested in, in learning more and seeing the resources on the site. Can go Could, I mention, can I mention uh, about, uh, we had a, an article posted today for Rare Disease Day. Um, on our website, um, Len Woodward from the UK, Linda Burke from the US, and Kamal Shaw from India collaborated together. Um, they've been working on, um, well, this is a, they just released their third article in the series about patients' experience and perception of the HOS diagnosis process. Um, it was based off a major survey uh, of our global HOS community. I encourage everybody to, to, to go to the website and read the article. It's called, You've Got HUS. I think you're gonna be able to put that, the link to that in the chat. Um, but it, it's, it's amazing. Um, the diagnostic, diagnostic process is so key. Um, I obviously, I'm aware of that because Erica was misdiagnosed for six months. And if, she, if this information had been available back in, when she got sick, um, you know, we, we would have had a different story, a better one. I mean, it's still, still a good story, but it would have been a better story. Thanks for, thanks for pointing out about the, the article. I know we've shared that as well as another resource. Um, so we've got time for a couple more questions. So we had a lot come in during live during the chat. So Dr. Dixon, here's one for you. Um, knowing about the recurrence of HUS once a kidney transplant is received, besides being on Altomyris, what can be done to prevent the new kidney from failing? Yeah, thanks for that question. So um, other than staying, remaining on treatment um, with the complement targeted therapy, the therapy specific for AHUS, I would also make sure that um, that you're working very closely with your transplant nephrologist so that you're taking your anti-rejection medicines um, faithfully, um, uh, having lab tests done uh, regularly to monitor the, the function of the kidney transplant. Um, and that would be um, independent of, of the AHUS, but, but just making sure that, um, uh, that you're following up regularly with the transplant nephrologist. Beyond that, there's nothing specific to AHUS to um, help keep it healthy um, other than um, either remaining on treatment or if you and your um, transplant nephrologist um, elect to um, come off of therapy, watching very, very closely for it to, um, to recur. Yeah, and then you know, the kidney fund as well, um, is just a, has a wealth of, of information and resources for anyone that has, um, you know, a, is you're, you're either on dialysis or have a, a transplant to those. There's information beyond just AHUS that you can um, find on there as well. Um, so another question for you, Dr. Dixon, can pediatric patients be dosed more frequently during induction if they are getting it emergently and not fully vaccinated yet? Yes, I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, that's been my experience uh, many times with pediatric patients who are newly diagnosed with the AHUS. They may need some supplemental doses in between the standard dosing regimen, um, especially if you're seeing signs of improvement and that, the, that improvement is then um, backsliding, if you will. Um, uh, even if unvaccinated, I think as long as someone is receiving preventative antibiotics to protect you against the meningococcus, um, that supplemental dosing is, is perfectly, um, perfectly acceptable and often uh, necessary. Got it. 
All right, I think we'll do one more question before we wrap up for the day. Um, so let's see here. How does having AHUS affect um, other organs that were not involved at the onset? Um, that's a great question. So um, I think generally speaking, um, if the disease is uh, controlled with, um, with treatment, um, other organs should not have ongoing or newly um, be newly affected by AHUS if the disease is controlled with the medication. Um, uh, that said, um, sometimes if you're only relying on um, evidence of um, platelets and red blood cells, uh, uh, hemolysis markers as being uh, complete evidence of, uh, of disease, um, control that may miss um, ongoing disease activity that's happening, even if the, the hematology, the red blood cells and the platelets are have normalized. So I think that um, really just uh, requires um, you working closely with your healthcare provider to determine are these other symptoms that you may be experiencing related to uncontrolled disease activity? Is it related to uh, perhaps um, the uh, uncommon occurrence of symptoms related to the infusions the, the medic uh, or the treatments, or is it um, completely unrelated? So um, bringing those symptoms up with your healthcare provider, um, either your primary care doctor or the doctor that is um, helping care uh, for your AHUS, um, I think is important. All right, well, thanks for um, answering all the questions that we got to today. Um, we're almost out of time, so we're going to start to wrap up. And again, I want to thank both of our guests for joining us today. We know there were a lot of packed, a lot of information packed into the discussion, and we got some to some great information today. Um, so for board today's webinar, we asked Dr. Dixon about two of the most important things that you should know about the topic of the day, and two things he recommends you do. So we want to make sure you remember this key information and walk away with a plan of action. So with that said, here are two things to know. So AHUS is a genetic disease of the complement system that it can, can affect many different organs in the body and it can affect each person differently. And two, complement targeted medicines are highly effective in the treatment of AHUS and researchers are also developing new treatment options. And if nothing else, two things that we want people uh, listening in today to do are if you have been diagnosed with AHUS and you're not on treatment, monitor your urine for blood and protein and check your blood pressure regularly for signs of relapse. And number two, connect with other patients, families, and medical experts in the vibrant AHUS and rare disease community. And, and as you heard from Jeff, it's, there's a lot of, um, a, a really great community out there and, and plenty of people to connect with and um, provide some support. So before we close, I'd like to again, thank everyone for joining. And I'd also like to thank Alexion for providing support on this educational program. To stay in the loop for upcoming events, be sure to like the American Kidney Fund on Facebook and send us your email through our website, kidneyfund.org. And lastly, please remember to complete the brief survey at the end of today's event. If you're on Zoom, you can click continue in your browser web page, web page to follow the link to the survey after the webinar ends. And if you're on Facebook, the link is in your chat right now. And we appreciate your honest feedback on this survey. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Dixon and Jeff for all this great information. Hope you, you all Ryan. stay well. Thank you, Ryan. Dr. Dixon, thank you. You are a great friend of our family. Thank you so much. Our global family. <laughs> it's great to be here and thank you. <laughs>